attributes or three of the, the, the key characteristics of a disciple are humility, mercy, and righteousness. That's what disciples should be because that's what our leader, Jesus Christ, is, right? He is humble, he is merciful, and he's righteous. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 18. We're going to be reading two parables. We're going to read the parable of the persistent widow first, and then the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector second. So with that, Luke chapter 18, and we're going to start at verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people, robbers, evildoers, and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance, and he would not even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those humble them, who humble themselves will be exalted. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come and fill this place, and fill our hearts, and fill our minds, and open our ears to receive your message. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we ask for all of this. In your precious and holy name, amen. All right, brothers and, sisters, brothers and sisters, before we get into the heart of this message, I want to deviate just a little bit, and I want to ask you this question. And the question is this. How do you know that you're right with God? And I mean this personally to you. How do you know that you're right with God? How do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you are counted among the Lord's? And can you know such a thing? Well, the answer is yes. The answer is yes, we can know as we go. But this is a question that everyone needs to answer. Several years ago, when Sally was a freshman, I sponsored a couple of her friends to go, from youth group, to go on a weekend church retreat. This retreat was in February. And while they were there on this weekend, we learned that during a bad snowstorm, a young girl, a friend of theirs, that was only one year ahead of them in school, had died. She lost control of her car while she was driving on icy roads. She was a new driver. She lost control of her car on a snowy, icy road. She hit an electric pole, and she was killed. The death of this young girl affected everyone in the school. And it really hit these two particularly hard because they didn't even know for three days until Monday that she had died. It was tragic. And besides tragic, it seemed so senseless that this young girl, full of promise, had died. For many of the students, this occasioned a, a crisis of doubt. It wasn't necessarily doubt of God or of the things of God necessarily. And I don't think anyone stopped believing in God. Personally, for me, I still affirmed every single thing that I knew in the scriptures and that the scriptures taught. And that, and that is where I drew my comfort trying to come to grips with this. I didn't question any of that. But what I think it did for a lot of those students and for me was that we started to wrestle with the question of 
how do I stand with God? How do I stand with God? I would field tons of questions from my students and other students. Questions like, do you think she's in heaven? Or if this happened to me, would I be in heaven? This accident was so unsettling, no one saw anything like this coming, and many folks were shook up. And as I considered the events of what happened and helped to counsel some of the students, I was as sure as ever that God was real and that I was a sinner and that I needed a savior. And I shared this over and over and over again with those students. But for some of my students, the reality of, a de of death of someone their age, of a peer, of a friend, made them wrestle with understanding whether or not they were saved. And not all of them were sure. And that is exactly what they were looking for. They were looking for an assurance of salvation. They were looking for an assurance of their salvation. So I encourage them to pray. And I encourage them to read their scriptures. And I encourage them to talk to God. And in time, they came to understand that their standing with God didn't depend on them or their teenage mistakes, or their teenage undependability. But their standing with God depends on God and his dependability. One thing, brothers and sisters, is absolutely certain, and that is that God is always dependable. That once we believe in him, once we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, once we place our faith in him, once we confess our sins to him and endeavor to repent and to walk in a new life, we can know with all hope and certainty that God is absolutely 100% true and dependable. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1, Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I am convinced that not everybody understands this fact. In fact, I suspect that most people think something along these lines. I think they believe that God has some celestial set of scales. And on one side of the scales, he weighs all of the good things that we've done. And I say good in quotation marks because we're all sinners. So what is our standard? Even the stuff that we do is good is not really good when measured to God. And on the other side of the scales, he weighs all of our sin. And whichever side of the scale tips determines our eternal destiny. And if we're good enough, which I suppose means that the good outweighs the bad, we get to go to heaven. But if there's more bad than good, then we're consigned to hell. Or based on what I saw last night, the elevator, right? The elevator to hell. But brothers and sisters, that is not what our Bible teaches. And even though it's not what it teaches, I'm guessing that there are many people who believe that or something like it. So please keep this in mind as we get into the scripture readings that we are going to go through today. We pick up in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. In verse 1 it says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So as we pick up in verse 1, in chapter 17, let's understand that Jesus had just finished speaking to his disciples on the subject of the last days and telling them that he would return and that his return would come suddenly, without any warning. He said the la in the last days, that is, in the days before the Son of Man returns, it would be like the days of Noah, that, they, that there would be difficult days, days that would not be conducive to faith. So now he talks to them about a life of faith in a world that is lacking faith. Brothers and sisters, that is the reason why Jesus' words are so essential for us today. For us in the here and now. We are living at a time, as Jesus indicated, when our society's hearts are failing due to a lack of trust in God. And what we have in this parable is a vital passage on prayer in the times that we live. Notice that he says he spoke this parable to them for this purpose, that people should pray and never give up. 
Jesus then proceeds to give two alternatives to any person who is living in difficult times. And as, and as with any time you have two options, you have to do one or the other. You will have to make up your mind which one you are going to do. Brothers and sisters, difficult times, in difficult times, we will either give up or we will pray and trust in God. Either we will live in days of fear or we will live in days of faith. And this is similar to what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5 when he says, pray without ceasing. When Paul says that, that doesn't mean that you're going to go to an all-day or an all-night prayer meeting because prayer is an attitude of life. It is an attitude of the life that we live. Prayer is more of an attitude of life than an action of lips. Remember that in his letters to the Romans, Paul wrote in chapter 8 that the Spirit itself would make intercession within us with groanings that could not be uttered. That is, these are our prayers that can't even be put into words. And many times, we do not have the words to pray, but we're praying nonetheless. And it is this entire life that is behind the words that are spoken that make prayer effective. If you're ever interested, there is a teeny tiny thin little book called Practicing the Presence by Brother Lawrence where he talks about how his entire life is prayer. As he's working, as he's eating, as he's doing the day-to-day, he is living an entire life of prayer. I read a story once of a missionary who was put in prison in China. And when they're put in prison in China, they're put into hard labor. So there's certain nasty jobs that they have to do while they're there. There was one specific missionary who, if they ever got the chance, and they did often, they would get the guards to give them latrine duty. And what latrine duty meant was that you put on a pair of boots that went up to your knees and you waded through all of the feces and stuff from all of the bathrooms of the camp with a broom or whatever and push it towards this cliff or hole or whatever to get the stuff moving so it could go down. As you can imagine, that's probably the most disgusting job someone could think of doing. When he was freed, he said he used to pray to the Lord that he would get that job every time. Because in that job, he was all alone. And he would sing hymns to the Lord while he was shoveling nastiness. An entire life of prayer. Regardless of the circumstances, an entire life of prayer. Pick it up at verse 2. So Jesus said, in a certain time there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. So what do we see in this judge? This judge was opposed to God and opposed to people. He did whatever he pleased, never asking himself, what does God want me to do? Or what do the people in general approve or disapprove of me doing? He was nothing but a self-consumed individual. And maybe in today's lingo, we would refer to someone like this as a narcissist. All we know for sure from this judge is that this judge had no love for justice. And as for sympathy or satisfaction for the oppressed, in his capacity as judge, where he would have been able to do something, he didn't know what sympathy was. Mercy, kindness, caring, these were completely foreign concepts to this judge. Brothers and sisters, this dishonest judge represents corrupted power, for he neither feared God nor sought justice for the people. And consider how awful he was that this judge broke both halves of the greatest commandment, right? Jesus said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And this judge loved neither God nor his neighbor. He broke both sides. On the other hand, we have the widow. And the widow represents complete helplessness. For she had no money to bribe this judge with. She had no political clout. And it's obvious that there was no one powerful enough to intervene on her behalf. You see, the scriptures teach with respect to the widows that God protects them. And how he urges people to be kind to them, blessing those who bless them and punishing those who hurt or take advantage of them. 
Widows during this time were the most vulnerable people in Jewish culture, and apparently this one had no family or family members that could even help her. And as we read, we can deduce that the judge and the widow live in the same area, so this leads to a confrontation. <coughs> the woman had some, somehow been unjustly treated. Someone may have deprived her of what little she had, or may have prevented her from attaining what was rightfully hers. So she went to this judge, hoping that he would give her justice, and she may, be, she, and she may have wanted punishment for her opponent. But the emphasis is on the urgent request of this destitute widow to get whatever she had been deprived of. Picking up again at verse 4. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't care about God or care about what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. So listen to this judge. This judge despised this woman and her cause and clearly considered her nothing more than a nuisance. However, the judge knew that the widow's claim was just, but she was probably not able to bribe them, not able to grease the skids. She didn't have any influence in the city, so he had no motivation to help her. However, the widow's persistence is what finally caused him to cave. So he says to himself, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Now think about that, brothers and sisters. We see here that he was worried about something. Perhaps he was worried that the woman would become so furious and so desperate that who knows what she would do. But at any rate, the widow's request was finally granted and she received whatever was due her. And picking up again in verse 6, And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? You know, many Bible teachers say that parables teach the value, that this parable teaches the value of persistent prayers. And in fact, it is referred to commonly as the parable of the persistent widow. And while I don't think that that is wrong, Sometimes I'm not so sure that that is the only lesson that this parable teaches. You see, this parable is not solely about persistent prayer, as though God will only hear you if you hold on and pray long enough. Because I see this parable as a parable of contrast, not a parable of comparison. And let me explain that a bit. So we know from other messages on the parables that parables were stories given by our Lord to illustrate some eternal truth. And as I said before, parables are stories with intent. The word parable comes from two Greek words. It comes from the word para, which means beside, and below, which means to throw. We get the word ball from that, by the way. So a parable means something that is thrown beside something else to tell you something about the object. And a good way where you can envision this is if you ever see anything on Facebook that's being sold and someone will put like a quarter next to it so that you can kind of get an idea of how big it is, right? So you see whatever is being sold, you see the quarter right next to it and you get an idea of the size of whatever it is you're buying. That quarter is basically a parable of whatever it is that's being purchased. A parable is a story that our Lord uses to illustrate a divine truth. And there's two ways that he did this. He would do this by comparison, and he would also do it by contrast. What's going on in this story is this. Our Lord is saying, when you come to the Lord in prayer, do you think that God is an unjust judge? Do you think God is an unjust judge? When you come to him in prayer, do you think that God is some kind of politician? Do you think that God is going to do something for you because of what you bring to him? Because of some kind of political reason? If that is what you think, you're wrong. God is not an unjust judge. That's what Jesus is saying. Here's the lesson, brothers and sisters. So, if this unjust judge would serve this poor woman justice because she kept coming to him continually, then why on earth 
Would you ever get discouraged going to our loving God who is not an unjust judge, but who actually wants to hear and answer your prayer? Brothers and sisters, why are God's people today so discouraged in their prayer life? Don't you know that our God is not unjust? You don't have to hang on to God's coattails and beg with him and plead with him. God wants to act on your behalf. And if we had that attitude, it would completely change our prayer life. To come into his presence knowing that he wants to hear our prayer. Too often we act as if God is like this unjust judge. And that we have to hold on to him for all we got or he won't hear us at all. But God is not an unjust judge. He is all good. He is all just. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to get everything that we ask for. Because sometimes the answer is no. And no was an answer, right? And sometimes the answer is something else. And that's also an answer. Because all prayer is answered. Even if sometimes we don't like the answer to the prayer, right? All prayer is answered, even if we don't like the answer to the prayer. Pick it up in verse 8. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That's a powerful verse. Jesus said regarding God's children that he will avenge them speedily. The idea is this. If the poor woman, with no hope of receiving help from a wicked, unscrupulous judge... How much sooner and greater will be the help a loving and heavenly father provides for his own dear children? <coughs> Brothers and sisters, if the question is asked, why will the Lord see that justice is done for his own quickly? The answer must be that he loves us so deeply that by God's grace, we have placed our faith and hope and trust in him. Then the contrast between God and this unjust judge in the parable is indescribably sharp. It is insurmountable. As Jesus continues, there can be no question that there will still be believers on earth when the Son of Man returns. But will there be faith, that persistent faith that keeps at it, as did the faith of this widow? You see, the question is not asked for the purpose of rhetorical speculation, but rather it is asked for our own self-examination. We each need to answer that question for ourselves. Brothers and sisters, you should always pray and not give up. We should pray with the right attitude of mind and heart. We should pray with confidence. After all, if an unjust judge helps a poor widow, how much more will our loving father meet the needs of his children? You see, we have open access into his treasury and can claim the gracious promises that he promises. So we ought to pray with faith and confidence. We ought to pray with faith and confidence. And then we move on to the next parable, starting at verse 9. And I love, really, verse 9 might be my favorite verse of this whole parable. But anyway. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Think about just think about that, that start. To those who were confident in themselves and looked down on everyone else, Jesus had this to say to them. If you read that verse, do you think that what follows is going to be complimentary of those folks that look down on everybody else? No. You know what's coming. Jesus told this parable, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector. Now there's no reason to doubt that Jesus addressed this parable to a group of Pharisees. And it is also clear that these two parables belong together. Jesus addressed this story to those who trusted in themselves and were of the opinion that everyone else around them amounted to nothing. Brothers and sisters, this description was not an exaggeration, but a true picture of what was wrong with the Pharisees of Jesus' day. And Jesus will use this parable to illustrate the difference between phony worship, between phony piety, and true repentance. Let me give a little context. 
During this time period, the temple was used not only for public religious transactions, for bringing of, but it was also used for the bringing of sacrifices, for teaching, and also for private devotions. It is not strange, therefore, that we see a Pharisee entering into the temple for that purpose. And whether or not this took place at one of the regular hours of prayer, as seems probable, or at some other time, doesn't seem certain and really isn't relevant. But at any rate, those belonging to the sect of the Pharisees considered themselves to be very pious. Praying at places where they could be seen was one of their habits and something that they very much looked forward to. This would have been like the, the, early, like the early biblical version of like America's Got Talent, right? They would stand up, puff up their chest, and let everybody see all the talent that they had, right? But here's the big twist. A dirty, sleazy, sinful tax collector entered at the same time as this wonderful Pharisee to pray. Pick it up at verse 11. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people, these robbers and evildoers and adulterers, and even that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything that I got. Think about this. Boldly, this Pharisee takes a stand. And it was not uncommon for Pharisees to pray while standing with their hands up and their eyes closed. And we've seen people like that, right? Woo, just here I am, right? Brothers and sisters, let me ask you this. In this prayer, who is the Pharisee speaking to? Who's he speaking to? I mean... He's praying to God outwardly because he says, oh God, when he starts the prayer. But in, inwardly and in all actuality, this man's talking to himself. He's praying about himself. And having mentioned God once, he never mentioned God again. Throughout his entire prayer, the Pharisee's congratulating himself. Nowhere in this prayer does he confess to his sins, and he doesn't ask for forgiveness. And really, why would he ask for forgiveness? Obviously, he hasn't done anything wrong, and he's perfect. He's doing what we like to call the humble brag, right? He's bragging about how humble he is, right? He begins his holy prayer by comparing himself to other people. But here's the catch, and I hope you didn't miss this. He doesn't make his comparisons to truly godly people like Simeon or Samuel or Jeremiah. No, he doesn't compare himself to them. He compares himself to to robbers. He says he's not a robber, even though he's, he's robbing from God the honor that's due him in his prayer. He says he's, he's not a cheat or a dishonest person, even though he's cheating himself out of any kind of blessing that he might receive from God. And he says he's not an adulterer. And while he might not have been an adulterer in the sense that he might not have been having some kind of illicit affair with his wife, but he sure was departing from the word of God and therefore making himself guilty of one of the worst adulteries of all, and that is cheating on the Lord. And that's cheating on the Lord. Ultimately, and to quote, dude, where's my car? And then, and then, right? I'm not like these evil robbers, cheaters, adulterers. And then, suddenly, a tax collector catches the Pharisee's attention. And so he also includes this nasty, dirty tax collector in his prayer by adding, I'm not like any robbers or cheaters or adulterers. I'm not even like this nasty tax collector. I'm not even like that nasty tax collector. And understand that back in biblical times, tax collectors were viewed so poorly, viewed so poorly, they would not even be accepted as witnesses in court. That's how poorly they were viewed. But here's the catch, brothers and sisters. Little did that man that he despised, little did that Pharisee know that that man that he despised was on his way to heaven. A place that the righteous Pharisee would never see unless a dramatic transformation would have occurred in his heart. You see, what the Pharisee has just done is pray an arrogant prayer. 
True prayer should humble us and make us love other people more. We should be like children coming to a loving father instead of an attorney that's bringing a charge against the defendant. Brothers and sisters, if prayer doesn't bless the one praying, it's not likely to bless anyone else either. He continues on in verse 12. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything that I get. You know, he believes that he's doing even more than the law requires. He says, I fast twice a week. The man not only fasts twice a year as was required by the law or in certain months or on specific holy days. No, no. He fasts twice a week. And when it comes to, to, to tithing, he goes all out beyond any expectation. Brothers and sisters, this old Pharisee is out there talking to an audience of one. He's talking to himself. He may think that he's talking to God, but his prayer never got higher than his own ears. And all he did was pat himself on the back and give himself a little pep talk and then walk right out of that temple strutting like a peacock so that everybody could watch him. Picking up in verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Brothers and sisters, God be merciful to me, a sinner, does not adequately express it. This tax collector would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but he beat on his chest. And basically what he was saying is, God, I am a poor sinner. I have no access to that mercy seat that's sitting over there in the Holy of Holies. I have no way to get there. Lord, if only you could make a way for me to get there. I want to come. If only you could make a way for me to get there. I want to come to that mercy seat. Our loving Savior said that that man's prayer was heard. And do you know why it was heard? Because Jesus Christ, right there and then, was on his way to the cross to make a mercy seat for that man, to make a way for that man. Jesus was on his way to the cross to cover that man and everyone who calls on his name. In the, in the letter of 1 John chapter 2, it says, and he is a propitiation for our sin, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. That fancy long word, propitiation, just simply means that Jesus is an atonement for our sin. He is a covering for our sin. He is a mercy seat, if you will, for our sin. Christ is the covering that our sin needs, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of everyone who call on his name and follow him. <clears throat> Praise the Lord, <laughs> brothers and sisters. That tax collector's prayer was answered. And here's the beautiful thing. You don't have to ask God to be merciful. You know why? Because he is merciful. You don't need to ask him to be merciful because he is merciful. Some people say we have to beg for mercy. But friends, what more can God do to show you how merciful he is? He gave his son for you. He says to the worst sinner, he says, you can come for there is room at the cross for you. I have to admit to you, friends, that I had to come to the mercy seat. And if you're God's child, you have to come to it as well where he died for your sins and he died for my sins and that penalty was paid and you don't have to beg him. You don't have to promise him anything. He knows that you're weak. He knows that you're pitiful. You do not have to join anything. You do not have to become somebody of importance. You can be like this poor, sinful tax collector. You can come and you can trust him and he will save you because our God is a good judge and he is loving and he is merciful. In verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you that this man rather than the other man went home justified to God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. Brothers and sisters, hear that. That sinner went home justified. 
God himself has announced that that sinner is justified, that he was made right, that he is now righteous in the eyes of God, and that his sins have been forgiven, blotted out. His transgressions have been removed as far as the east is from the west. They have been cast into the depths of the sea. And this forgiven sinner has now been adopted into the family of God. How awesome is that? Yeah. I have no doubt. Yeah, I know it blinked. That was cool, right? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I have no doubt that this tax collector left that temple that day changed forever. And that he was ready to leave his old ways behind and to follow the new life that he had in Jesus Christ. Have you guys ever met anyone that went through a near-death experience? You ever met anyone that went through a near-death experience? Those people are never the same. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, when you find Christ, you're dead. And then you're made alive in him. And we should never be the same. Was this, was this sinner perfect from that moment on? No. Guaranteed he sinned again. Guaranteed. But was he changed? And the answer is yes. Yes. He was a new creation. Because no one, no one who truly encounters the Lord will ever be the same again. Can't. Can't. Cannot. I had a friend had a near-death experience. Tells me he has never looked at another thing the same. Ever. Because he knows that God saved him for something. He knows that God saved him for something. And that's the way each and every one of us should view it. Just because we can't see it physically, that's exactly what happened to our souls. We were dead in our sins and tras trespasses and brought to life through Jesus Christ. So I'm gonna do something wild today. I mean, I hope you guys are ready to get wild, okay? I've been very thankful. Yeah, I know, it's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be really nuts. I've been really reflective and thankful for all the things that have gone on here in the last year. Charlotte and Sally and Ryan, if you guys wanna come up. But there's one thing that I've thought has not happened yet. And that is, and that is this. Our prayer rail up here has not gotten a lot of use.